without further ado, I will turn this over to uh, Alan. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed the event. Said, I'm Alan Hasler. I've uh, worked for Armstrong. I've been with the company for uh, about 34 years now. Uh, I've done a little bit of everything from installation to uh, the general management position now for our uh, local there, for our uh, local butler operations. Thanks, Tom. Uh, I'm more mostly known for the guy that does not wear a bow tie. I mean, don't own one, don't even know if I can tie one. I don't think Jordan does either. I think they clip on it. That's okay. It still looks good. Um, if, if I make a mistake, I definitely don't want to hear about it because I don't have 45 years left to stress over. So just keep that to yourself, please. A few housekeeping rules. Um, what we'll do is each panelist will briefly introduce themselves. Uh, after the brief induction, uh, we'll have a structured questionnaire that's relevant to their day-to-day -day work. Uh, at your table, you'll see some note cards with some pens. You can write down questions that you have on those note cards. And please include your name or your company name. Uh, any questions with no names will not be accepted. And we'll have representatives roaming around the room and collecting those cards. Uh, after we get through our questionnaire planning, we'll go through uh, those cards and try to get through as many of those questions as we can. Chamber for um, hosting us this morning to Sherry Kine, who always does a wonderful job uh, here at the atrium and uh, making us all comfortable in the move. And thanks to the 11th frame for their effort at hosting us and the fact that we had to move is um, sort of overwhelming. But nonetheless, what is important here is that um, we can sit up here and talk, but the reality is it's all of you um, that make the state of this county what it is. Uh, your work and everything that you do every day is what leads to where we are. So we're, we, can stand up, we can sit up here and talk about all the things that are happening, but the reality of it is the people here in this room are the ones that are making it happen, and we thank you and salute you for that. We also are really um, proud of the partnerships, you know, that we have in Butler County with our state, our federal, state, and local officials. Um, credit due to all of our uh, senators and congressmen for their help, in particular local congressman Mike Kelly, who, you know, understands our county and our community, and so They've all helped us uh, bring money back to this community, as well as our state officials who are here today and our state representatives who we've seen in the room. And then our municipalities who, um, that really is the biggest part of our focus is helping municipalities get things done that they want to get done. So we're just very grateful um, to those partnerships. Also broader in the region. And you heard um, Jordan mention there are some very key regional leaders here today that we are working with on major projects in transportation and broadband, including Mr. Fitzgerald from the SBC. So thanks for coming up, right? <laughs> We're glad to have you here, as well as I think Andy Waples here, um, who also has worked on the broadband project with us in the past. So lots of regional partners, all very key and important to the success of our county. Thank you for all coming out this morning. We look forward to the conversation. Good morning. Good morning, I'm Kim Geyer, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you today. I appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedules to join us for this Stay in the County address. It's important that we share and communicate and, and be transparent in providing some information that hopefully helps you that you can take away from today um, and, and make applications throughout the county in your respective uh, venues. Um, this is an impressive group to see how much interest is here and how much energy and, and, and time, you know, people have allotted uh, to make this such an important event here in our county. And we're very grateful and appreciative of that and all the partnerships and uh, the collaboration that we have with many of you throughout this room, as Leslie said, to make things happen that are good here in Butler County. 
uh, enhance the quality of life, enhance our education systems, enhance our business and industries uh, that exist here throughout the county. Um, we work daily uh, to do the work that's necessary here in the county as county commissioners um, in serving the people such as yourselves and here in Butler County. Uh, we spent the last week in Harrisburg and uh, returned last night from Washington, D.C. And when we were at the Capitol yesterday and I saw the thousands of people that were there with all various interests and just kind of stood there for a moment and, and watched all the people coming and going and so many um, diverse cultures were represented uh, throughout the Capitol that day as we were going down the hallways. Um, it made me realize that everybody had issues that they cared about. And what was important was that they were there, they showed up. They cared enough to show up at the nation's capital to advocate and to express and convey those issues. And so that, uh, that gave me a really good feeling about how government should work and how proud I was of our country, you know, just watching the people yesterday, coming and going, doing what they were doing, and um, how we have that liberty to be able to express ourselves and advocate for other people, such as our counties, in a way to try, in an effort to make things happen, in an effort to um, make things better for the people back home. It's a, it was a very humbling experience, and. Um, very appreciative of, of having that experience uh, to represent Butler County and to advocate on your behalf. So thank you. Good morning. Can you hear me now? No. no. Can you hear me now? Yes. There we go. All right. Thanks, Tony. So first of all, thank you all for coming. I don't know what Jordy lied about on the application to be here, but I don't know how many of you realize that we're just going to be here talking, right? I mean, I don't know how good the breakfast was explained on the flyer, but God bless him. He, he really did a good job. I think they doubled the attendance for this, and that's really good. Okay, well, I'm not singing. <laughs> uh, Kevin Boozle of Butler County. I live in the northern part of Butler County, but I think that um, I think Kim Blaze over the fact of what we just went through in the last week, uh, going to Harrisburg and going to D.C., and making your voices known because, you know, as Kim said, there is a lot of issues on, on all fronts, whether it be business, residential, manufacturing, housing, employment, uh, workforce, uh, college, education. Uh, there's a million of them that we can run through. And, uh, you know, I'm proud to serve. In fact, I, I can't tell you how humbled I am to be able to go and talk on your behalf. But first, we have to listen. And that's why I like these events. And so I really enjoy coming here. And everyone has some, there's not too many people in this room that I, I would say there's not too many people in this room that none of us know, and there's probably not too many that I don't know. And I, I'm, I'm grateful for that relationship. I really do like to be able to reach out to people, and it helps us out the time. So thank you for that. I'm going to be asked to talk a little bit about what County Commissioners Association of Pennsylvania does, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But that's why we were there, um, listening to the governor talk about his budget. Governor Shapiro spoke about what he plans to do. Um, good, bad, or indifferent, that's going to be up to the legislator. Thank you guys for doing what you're going to do. Uh, to figure out how that budget process works out. And, and hopefully, and I know that they're going to work on our behalf and make sure that our voice is heard at that level as well. So I thank you for your service. Uh, moving into the uh, DC realm and going out there to uh, initiate more funding for projects, um, regardless of what they are, and, and to recognize our leaders and at the congressional level is important. Senator Casey, Senator Fetterman's office, we were there, we went to the Federal Highway Transportation. Um, and I gotta tell you, they tell us all the time, we're about the only counties that go out uh, and do this. And it's a little closer for us in Pennsylvania, but, but it is uh, humbling to hear that, and I'm glad to be the ones that are out there in front of them. We do it with PennDOT locally, too. Uh, they know all of us, and that's, a, that's an important part of what we do. Uh, our schools, our, our uh, presidents, there's, there's a relationship that matters in this level, and I think that it's really important that we show our, our put our best foot forward for Butler County, and I think that's what you're seeing in this room, is our best foot. It's you guys, and you're, you're kicking it, and we appreciate everything you do. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Mark Gordon. Some of you know that in 2016, I retired from A.K. Steele. I was their executive under the Electric steel businesses. 
and thinking I was going to just be retired, then this opportunity with these newly elected commissioners to come join them and help them drive economic development. You know, I had a lot of successes in my career, and I have to tell you, some of those successes were really pale in comparison to the last four or five years being able to help people in our community make a difference. You know, the commissioner spoke about being in D.C. the last couple of days, and in Harrisburg before that. Thank you to all of our federal and state elected officials. Each of the commissioners highlighted a little bit of, of grant programs that we've been able to receive. You know, it's just not about the grants. One of the things that we have been able to do with the leadership here in Butler County is leverage those dollars. And I'll give you an example. We were fortunate enough to secure two federal bill awards, one for 20 million and one for 25 million. It was for the State Route 228 corridor. We were able to leverage that $45 million into $186 million that has currently been invested on that corridor. Some of that leverage is the municipalities, some of the leverage is the county, and some of the leverage is the state. So, um, just one example. Thank you for being here this morning and I uh, look forward to, uh, to trying to answer your questions. Thank you. Uh, I first must mention I've been given the blessing to refer to our panelists by their first name. I was brought up to be proper, and uh, so you will hear me address them that way. I'm allowed to. I really thought it would have been cool to say Chief Mark, but he asked me to please just refer to him as Mark. So, okay, let's get started. Um, I guess since I hold the microphone, I'm going to broadband questions. So, Leslie, this is for you. There are concentrated efforts to expand high-speed broadband access to rural areas of Pennsylvania. Butler County sits in a unique position as one of the largest broadband providers in the county calls this home. What are the county's plans to work with private partners to expand reliable internet services to all residents and businesses in Butler County? <laughs> One wire, infinite possibilities, just okay. saying. <laughs> so, thank you, Alan. Um, first of all, you know, I, I've often said that um, you can't move forward on a project without a plan. And you have to come with plans that are well, um, well thought out, uh, outcomes defined. And we were very fortunate to be part of the Southwest PA Commission that drew us a roadmap for broadband. Um, and when Alan actually did the data research and we uh, looked at the areas and uh, provided the information to us necessary to begin to start to look at how we would address this issue in our county. So that, that's number one, we came with a plan. Then we you know, have worked together, um, particularly um, with Armstrong, um, to help establish the priorities and amongst ourselves even, looking at you know, how, how are we going to approach this and what's key and critical. And after having come through COVID, I think we realized that one of the most critical pieces was being able to make sure that our young people, our students, have access um, to broadband. And so by looking at this project by school district, it was helpful to begin to figure out where you begin, where you start in, um, with making sure that we get broadband uh, to every household and every business um, and every key community institution where people can gather and make use of, um, of that technology. So, um, we, and that, so we actually worked with Armstrong to um, apply for the first round of the state's level funding, um, the state level funding, I should say, on the broadband capital project uh, that would help us connect uh, 200 miles of fiber, uh, adding another 1,555 units, I think that is, added. Okay. okay. <laughs> in both the Slipper Rock and um, um, Montauk, or 
Yes, Lonitaw School District. So this would help, uh, and those were projects that were identified um, specifically also in that in that plan, in the broadband plan. So those, and if we if we are unsuccessful in that uh, initial capital request, we'll begin once the, the federal money begins to roll out, then we'll, we'll, we'll go after that piece next. But um, we know that we have priorities, and we know that the roadmap is there, um, and that's a big key to that. We also are in the process right now of um, looking and hiring a project manager um, that would help us uh, with the adoption piece, because as you can see, as I highlight on this, um, you know, adoption, adoption, adoption. It doesn't do us any good if we run hundreds and hundreds of miles of fiber and people don't take advantage of it. Um, so being able to call upon our partners all throughout the county, in particular things like aging and the senior centers and our uh, partners at United Way and other agencies out there who all of the nonprofit agencies who serve the community, <clears throat> along with our educational institutions, to help make sure that people are taking advantage of it because we don't want the investment to be a lost investment. And you know, we can, like we said, we can run miles of fiber, but if people aren't plugged in, it doesn't, doesn't help us. So um, we know those are the priorities that we've you know, chosen uh, to get started with. I also, we also have, um, the county has, uh, is tied into 11 uh, towers for our, um, 911 system and some of those towers do not have fiber run to the tower so now we're beginning to look at you know where are the intersects of those uh, with the projects that we've identified in the areas that we've identified to prioritize and how do we uh, work with the providers there to make sure that we have fiber to those towers because um, 911 is certainly critical and we want to make sure that um, we have the redundancy that's needed to provide a, an emergency uh, communication system for um, all of our um, first responders. So um, that's going to be another thing we're going to start to look at map-wise is, you know, where are those towers in relationship to the two projects that we have already identified and that may give us some idea on where we need to go next. Um, so we're going to work through this and I had said before when this came up last year, you know, that lots of people rushed out to, to put uh, money into this and it's been an advantage to sit back just a little and take our time and make sure that um, the investments get made in the right places that will generate the return and to learn from others and also make sure as Mark indicated the most important thing is how do we leverage whatever funding we may have available to us uh, to make all of this go further and um, you know kudos to the counties that jumped out there uh, but I think they may have invested money that they could have been able to invest in other places because they didn't wait uh, for the for the federal money brought down. So um, I think just kind of waiting and watching has been a um, a good a good strategy for us so far, and um, we're looking forward to getting these getting these two projects uh, funded and moving, and then we'll we'll keep working it out from there. Thank you. All right. Not only is broadband infrastructure a vital part of a healthy community, infrastructure in general can make or break growth. Talk about your office's role in infrastructure development, specifically the work at the AC Valley Industrial Site and what the future holds for that site conveniently located just off of your state aid. Thank you, Natalie. So, uh, we talk about economic development. I think to a lot of people that means new businesses. Well, fundamental to all of them along I-80, and it's about halfway, it makes for a very lucrative logistics site, and we actually have several logistics companies today uh, looking at that remaining 80 acres. Thank you. I just, just want to add um, quickly to that. Um, also, Two other key pieces of the funding for that. One is we owe some credit to Senator Pittman, who is no longer in our area, but um, Senator Pittman helped us secure um, a grant for that uh, project. And also um, the ARC grant, you know, uh, through SBC and working with SBC, the ARC, we were able to secure um, Appalachian Regional Commission funding 
um, to help in that capital stack. So just wanted to make sure that we gave that shout out to Senator Pittman because it was a long time waiting for him to, to see that, that money come to fruition and we were grateful to him for that. Thank you, Mark. Kim, before we jump into industrial development, let's talk education and the vital role it plays in workforce development. Mm -hmm. Colleges everywhere are at crossroads. Governor Shapiro just unveiled a plan to combine the state's system of higher education with all the state community college. As part of this plan, all fine students could have college tuition <coughs> for just $1,000. Combine that with the recent retirement announcement of Dr. Nicholas Newpower, the longest tenured president of community colleges in the state, and provide some thought on the bold plans for the future of higher education. Okay, so I so I sit on the um, the EC3 board of trustees as the ex officio for the county. So I'm going to share some thoughts today about the governor's proposal. Um, but before I do uh, do that, I, I just want to set the, the climate that we're all experiencing. Um, as education institutions across the country, they're experiencing uh, large demographic shifts, declining enrollment. Um, adding to those struggles, you have students and parents receiving mixed messages about um, this, this job no longer requires a college degree, and you have... Uh, loan forgiveness that is um, in the billions that uh, has been provided to students throughout the country. So students and parents are really rethinking the traditional career and college pathways um, due to the following factors. Uh, Post-COVID, the current inflationary economy, student loan debt versus the job market, challenging workforces by the desire to work remotely while staying at home. And to say the colleges are at a crossroads is an understatement. But the bright light in all of this here in Butler County is the fact that our county possesses two amazing institutions. The first referred to as the Communities College, known as Butler County Community College, and the second, Slippery Rock University, which both provide an affordable and qualitative, qualitative education to students in a variety of career fields of study. In 2023, Butler County and Slippery Rock University gained a new presidential education leader in Dr. Karen Riley, who is committed to taking the rock to the next level. And also in 2023, long-tenured presidential education leader, Dr. Nicholas Newpower, announced his retirement after 17 years of providing stability and leadership at BC3. Dr. Newpower's leadership style has provided growth and uh, great leadership and stability in making Butler County Community College the number one community college for the ninth consecutive year in a row. And uh, the work that in the coming year that Dr. Newpower will be doing with working with the Board of Trustees on their search for a new president to lead the institution forward uh, will be a transitional time, uh, not only for BC3, but all Pennsylvania's education institutions. So the transition due to the governor's proposal, uh, his plan is this, is to unify 25 education institutions, including all 15 community colleges, with the 10 public universities making up the Pennsylvania system of higher education. I think we can all universally agree and understand that we must do something fundamentally different about the way we deliver higher education here in Pennsylvania. It's difficult to surmise the expectations of what is planned, what is to occur, or what the rollout of this new proposal will be without knowing all the details. But what we do know is this. The unified system would enable all institutions to remain independent institutions, but would come under the purview of one governing board. There would be no plans to close campuses or cut staff or merge two institutions into one, according to the governor's team. However, my question is, how does the jointure of both the community colleges who are losing 37% enrollment and unifying it under another entity 
that has a 30% a enrollment um, declining make college more affordable. How do we accomplish that, putting both under the same umbrella without the reduction of physical campuses and staff? The plan includes investing $279 million towards offsetting costs for Pennsylvania residents making no more than the median income would pay no more than $1,000 in tuition and fees at both state universities and community colleges. And the median income in Pennsylvania is $70,000. So in addition, the plan would increase the FIA grants for all students applying for such grants by another $1,000. So under the plan, a performance-based funding model will fund colleges for performance and achievement of results in specific areas of study related to, and is quoted, as to what's most important to the Commonwealth. This funding formula would no longer require a two-thirds vote in the legislature and would remove the ability of our elected leaders to leverage and allocate state funding during the state budget process. Instead, the performance-based funding formula would run through the Pennsylvania Department of Education. So given some of the details that I do know, here are some of my questions. Would this system come under one chancellor and state board of trustees? Would we, as an institution, lose our autonomy as the community's college or as Slippery Rock University? What would the impact be on our taxpayers and students, our county? What effect would this have on our community? If this effort really was about affordability and accessibility for students, we truly already have that pathway here with our community colleges. It exists. Our community colleges, if you don't know, already serve the largest portion in population of the lowest socioeconomic students throughout the Commonwealth. How is this new model going to improve upon that and change that? Other than free tuition being proposed for those making under $70,000, currently these same students have access to Pell Grants and other subsidies. Is local control going to be taken away? Is it going to be lost with the loss of a governing board of trustees making local control decisions closest to people, now becoming advisory boards instead? 67% of uh, students here at BC3 are transfer students seeking to uh, transfer to a higher education pathway. And we have many reciprocal agreements already in place to make that transfer even, even more easier for them, transferring credits for courses taken. We have over 100 reciprocal agreements with various institutions, 40 probably being alone with Slippery Rock University. How will the local sponsors of the community colleges be dealt with, such as the county here in Butler County? We incur and, and contribute an annual contribution annually to the community college. What would the ownership of buildings and facilities and properties become? Would community colleges become more about workforce development, training, in lieu of academics? These are some of the questions that have been answered in the governor's blueprint that was released on February 27th. But the blueprint is not as an innovative creative and original as being purported to be. There are states such as Minnesota, Wisconsin, New Hampshire, Connecticut, and many other states throughout the country already that have implemented this very same unified system. And this, uh, the enrollment levels from these states, if you go back in the past two years and you look to see if there was a significant gain of students into those state systems, there really wasn't. There, it's the enrollment levels still remain pretty minimal. So looking ahead as leaders in this room, we must remain diligent to monitor the situation that's unfolding at the state level. And we need to have our voices heard when opportunities present themselves. And this dynamic shift is going to impact everybody in this room in varying ways. Fortunately for Butler County, we've got young leaders who will be stepping up into new roles of leadership 
to help us understand and stabilize the changes and the challenges before us, regardless of where we sit as a student, parent, faculty member, or to help a taxpayer as we navigate through this new system. And uh, these leaders are gonna have to help the public understand the relevancy and value of a college degree or credential. They're gonna have, have to help us understand the dire need that Pennsylvania is facing a growing workforce crisis, whereas we need 61,000 more people with the right college degree or credentials to fill the open jobs that exist statewide. <laughs> And families are going to need to know that they can afford to send their children to college without incurring excessive debt and can achieve that financial goal now and through both either BC3 and the Slippery Rock University pathway. So in closing, this proposal is contingent upon the state legislature in the coming months. However, the Pennsylvania Deputy Secretary and Commissioner for Post-Secondary and Higher Education, Rebecca Shaw, indicates that this will be done and implemented by this June 30th. Butler County Community College is known as the Pioneers, having been the first community college designated in Western Pennsylvania. Um, we're going to really need that resilient pioneer spirit in the coming year as we navigate through this education system for the two exceptional higher institutions that exist here and uh, provide education to our students here in Butler County. So thank you. Thank you, Kim. Kevin, this is a multi-question question. question. <laughs> I'm going to try to summarize it, because if not, you'll probably be the last speaker of the morning. And I want to get through some more. You've been really active in the uh, County Commissioners Association of Pennsylvania, including holding leadership roles in the organization. So what is this organization? What role does it play? Yeah. Benefits for the county, you know, priorities, legislative speaking, moving forward. Talk about that. Sure. Absolutely, thank you. The County Commissioners Association of Pennsylvania is comprised of 67 counties, and each county has five votes bipartisan or nonpartisan uh, organization. What's important about that is that is supposed to be the unified voice of Pennsylvania counties for the state legislature and even federal. They're looked upon, they're, they're, they're involved with the uh, NACO, which is a national organization, which I also sit on some of their boards, but they have great committees and some of those committees of governance, which Kim uh, chairs, uh, she has a leadership role on the board as well. Um, I'm the former chairman, but I'm also the policy and resolutions chairman for the CCAP. Also involved in the uh, AM, AM and VA, Emergency Management and Veterans uh, Assistance Program uh, Committee. And there are several other committees that affect everything we do in accounting. Uh, Leslie's worked as treasurer. She had leadership role there on the board as well. And she's helped in the service? Yeah, in elections. In elections. Oh, she's lucky. Um, <laughs> but all of these things impact us every day. So. What better way, the three of us, we can talk all day, but when we get in front of our peers and we listen to other counties, other similar counties, some are very different counties. You know, we can talk to somebody from Allegheny, they have a different issue on the budget than we have here in Butler, or Greene County, which has 38,000 residents. There's a, there's a lot of diversity in our state, and as you've been to one county, you've seen once literally one county. So some of the things that they come up with every year is a platform, and a platform can include anything, literally any of those committees bring up, say this is something we need to have a policy, something for the legislative uh, body of the CCAP to be able to go to the State House and Capitol and Senate and say, look, this is where our position is. This is what it is. They don't have to question it. They don't have to go out and ask the commissioners every time they have a question. Some of them we may personally agree with and some of them we may personally disagree with. And that's okay. But I think the important part is they're getting the full scope of the state. And so that is important. We can then go to Harrisburg and advocate our, our value system for Butler County as well as the federal side. So I do want to run over a few priority ones of 2024 just real quickly, which is county mental health funded basing, based funding increase. So a few years back, the um, state had reduced the amount of mental health funds. And working in mental health field for over 20 years, uh, mental health, alcohol, homeless programming, one of the things that I was responsible for 
uh, back when I worked for Irene Stacy's Community Mental Health Center was moving people back home from state institutions, one of which was Torrance State Hospital. In order to do that, they had to have community-based funds set up. And so, so all the dollars we saved while they closed a the bed or two or three or ten, all of that money was supposed to come back to a community-based impact fund. And it did. The unfortunate part was it never grew. It took a hit. It took a 10% cut. And so what happens when somebody doesn't receive the services that are required? They were required in a hospital, and now they're in a community. And this is what you may be seeing in a community today. And unfortunately, while our, we have great service programs, CCR, ANR, NDC, Catholic Charities, Lighthouse, we have lots of services here in Buffalo We're blessed, and I want to say thank you, truly, the hospital. It's critical that we maintain this level of funding or bad things happen. Bad things happen when somebody can't get to their get to their doctor or medicine or to their appointments. And so oftentimes, too many times, they end up in a criminal justice system, which is what we've seen over and over again. And so our, our jail, our county jail and our state, have really became quasi-drug and alcohol and mental health treatment facilities. And we have a lot of funding that goes into that program as well. So the, there's also something else that a lot of community doesn't know is that when somebody crawls, we have a threshold problem, and you cross over the jail threshold, you go in, remember, you're only charged, you're not guilty, you lose all your insurance, regardless of what it is. Independent insurance, private insurance, med Medicaid, Medicare, and every one of those costs are borne by the taxpayer in Butler County. And so keeping that in mind, some of the things we advocate for is making sure that the preventative mental health funding stays in place, but we also fight for funds to make sure that that health care cost isn't borne only by the residents of Buffalo County. So, in addition to that, we have addressing inmate mental health issues. Again, uh, the more we can do of that and help people succeed, we have, uh, I know Rich Goldinger is here and he's worked hard on the uh, drug and alcohol courts, the mental health courts, the veterans courts, and what that does is draws in all the resources that we have available in Butler County and says, what do we need to do to help somebody become successful? To put somebody in jail is one thing, and, and, and part of this issue is putting them in jail is just the the iceberg of cost. That's not the only cost one. We have families impacted. We have children and youth involved. We have aging involved. We have housing involved. We have uh, federal programs involved, food programs involved. So when you look at taking somebody out of the workforce, putting them in jail, housing them, and feeding them, where does that other money come from? And if, if we don't have a good relationship, which we do, and I'm thankful for it, we have great relationships with our judges here in Butler County, too, so I've got to give them a shout out. Uh, those are the types of things that we have to work on for all of our county, for all of our counties across the state. Um, another uh, priority is vote by mail reforms, giving counties uh, needed tools to run fair, secure, accurate elections, restoring public trust in the election system. You may or may not know that they've changed the entire balloting system. Uh, mail-in balloting, absentee ballot, they look different, they're different colors, they're um, clearly written. Uh, we, we've got, we've, we've received a little more guidance on it, but there's still issues. And some of those issues are, uh, some of the things that are up in court is, is a signature required? Is a date required? So the signature still is, the date is no longer required at this point, but we still have it in court, so we don't know what to go with yet. So those are things we keep an eye on, that our, our association keeps us plugged into. Our right to know law reform. We are jam packed with right to know, and literally it costs us hundreds of thousands of dollars at our county level. And that is for multiple reasons, which I don't think we, we're hiding from you. We're, we're here, we're willing to take it on the chin, right? But I think that people want to make a scene of something. They want to find something, like dig for something, which in most parts, I'm okay with that. The unfortunate part is the way they go about it. And, and the way they go about it is they keep filing vexatious reports. We keep making our law, our, our solicitor, we have a, a paralegal now, we have a right to know officer now, we have, so we've had to build up our staffing just to be able to handle these vexatious requests. And they don't stop during an election. During an election they get 10 times worse, and we know that. And that causes a, a ball down in the entire system. So we're looking at all of those issues uh, to see what can be done at our legislative side. Increasing prevailing wage threshold. This is one that Kim, I think, advanced. Enhancing county flexibility to allocate limited financial resources across the projects and prioritize essential services, easing the burden of tax credit and government budget. Most people don't realize that there is a 25,000 uh, threshold of a prevailing wage. In this, in this scenario, uh, when we go out to 
build a building or fix the lobby or whatever. If it's government, school, or an authority, they have to go out for a bid after 25000 So that requires a prevailing uh, wage, uh, and it requires um, uh, us to pay at a higher rate. And that has to be known because if you raise it, what happens? So there's a couple of things, and we want to make sure that people understand this. If, it goes, if you follow the 1960, which is when that was passed, to, to today, it'll be close to 160,000, I think. Uh, oh, crap. 250,000. Um, so I'm reading my notes here. They don't even have 250. So, so they're trying to increase that threshold up. And so what that could do for municipalities and, and counties to save money. Uh, there is a, the other concerning factor, because I'm sure the committee's talked about what happens to the other side. So the other thing that you could see happen if you go to 250000 well, I could do a half a million dollar project that was cutting phase one and phase two, and I don't have pay for minimum wage. That's a concern. So we have to look at that. We have to make sure that that doesn't happen. So there are things that, that are in here, like I said, we agree, disagree, it doesn't matter. We are presenting with the counties across the state, and this is their vote. They voted. Um, juvenile detention capacity crisis is another uh, priority. In Butler County, as Mark mentioned, the AC Valley area with the water and the sewage, there was a uh, child detention center right, right in that same complex that had been closed for several years. And that we literally have children, children, youth, people in detention that are sat on by our sheriffs in our CYS office because there's nowhere to place them. There's nowhere to go. And that's not healthy for that, for that youth. It's not healthy for our staff. It's not healthy for our community. So it, part of this part, I and mean, it's a very small part, is a 60-bed facility that was opened up by the state in that facility, and they are state-funded uh, uh, employment of about 120 to 140 jobs is what they expect to come out of that in that region, which is a northern tier region, which is, uh, I think the minimum wage starting out there is like $22 an hour, which is really good in that area. And so th that's something that um, we have addressed. This came out of CCAP. Um, and when I found out there was a need, we reached out to the Health and Human Services and said, look, we have this facility, it's maybe something we want to look at. Um, so that, that came to me. I only have two more, I promise I'll shut up. <laughs> 911 funding and authorization, reauthorization, this is critical. This was a big deal. This was one that, in Butler County, we were getting a short stick. And I mean that sincerely. For Out of, 60, out of, out of 67 counties, Butler County was getting <coughs> the least amount of that funding for decades. It was nearly a million dollars short. Another county, well, we got a dollar fifteen. I'll never forget this because I testified at Senate hearings for this. We got a dollar fifteen per capita, I meaning per person. Another county was getting over six dollars per capita per person because the formula was wrong. It was wrong from day one. Everyone knew it, but nobody wanted to change it because when you change it, you have winners and losers if you don't raise the money. If I have a hundred million dollars to give out and I short this one and I give it to this one. Somebody's not going to be happy, so nobody wanted to touch it, and they passed it by until finally this year they passed the 911 reauthorization, moving it from 165 to $1.95, so it did increase the funding. But the important part was CCAP was the one that could identify from working with all the counties the actual numbers, $2.30. But we didn't get that. We got $1.95. So we're short again. Some people didn't receive any. They voted on a formula that we were better off in Butler County brought us up. And some people didn't get part of anything increased because that's how you adjust the uh, right shift, right? So that's kind of where that was at. But that's an ongoing issue. Now it's only for two years and they're going to do another study. I, I have no words for that. that I, if you can't tell by now what's happening in the 911 systems and what we've done and our investments in 911 and how critical that is, that's really important. And finally, broadband access and development, which we've already talked about, so I get to say a little bit about it. <laughs> Any other question? Uh, absolutely <laughs> not. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I asked. Uh, <laughs> that's good. good stuff. Uh, Leslie. I'm going to make up time. Yeah, so <laughs> the key words here is staying on track. Staying on track with infrastructure. Let's talk transportation. Transportation infrastructure, like many publicly funded services, has a gap of available capital for the cost of the proposed upgrade. Can you talk about the county strategy to obtain adequate funds and on the transportation infrastructure funding priorities? So I'm going to roll through this very quickly. First of all, as we talk about formula funds for funding, um, the federal funding for transportation comes through the Southwest PA region, and we work with our 10 counties in the region 
<clears throat> to formulate the transportation improvement plan and get projects on that transportation improvement plan via, um, via the formula funds. The key issue for us was, and what had not happened, is we were not going after competitive funding in the past to help close those gaps. So the only way to close those gaps is by going after competitive funding. To do that, you have to come with a strategy and you've got to come with funding. So the two things that happened there is, uh, one, we hired a consultant um, to help us uh, go after that competitive funding and to help structure, um, not only to, to prepare the applications, but then to prepare us to go down and talk to legislators and then to come with a package and a plan and a strategy and we knew what our funding needed to be when we got there. Um, in doing so, we also are allowing our municipalities a bite of that apple and to be able to also take advantage of that consultant to apply for funds and we've been able to leverage funds for many of our municipalities for transportation projects. But also, um, as, as I said, we had to have a strategy, but we had to put money on the table. And Mark talked a little bit about how, you know, two federal bill grants uh, leveraged a lot, a lot more money, uh, $200 million almost. So the way that we did that was, of course, <clears throat> we passed a very unpopular local use fee, um, which was the, the thing that we took it on the chin for. Uh, but again, that's that extra $5 on your registration fee, so if you want to be mad at us for that, you can. <laughs> However, um, that did create that return on investment, of the $40 million that you now see going across the 228 corridor, in addition to other roadway projects uh, all across the county that we uh, used that local use fee money for, and significant bridge improvements as well. So, we have ten, it's 10 years worth of fund, funding. So it generates about a million dollars a year, and it allowed us to be able to put these funding packages together to be able to get these projects done. In addition, Mark mentioned the Infrastructure Bank, which is doing the, um, the subsidized lending for municipalities to help complete those projects, and it was significant to some of these packages that we've been able to put together. Um, finally, I think, you know, the relationships and advocacy are key and have been key to that, and I mentioned that in the sort of opening comments that our partnership with the SBC, the state, federal, and municipal, United States Department of Transportation, um, all very much in a bipartisan way, um, and then also with PennDOT. Um, you know, PennDOT, in the beginning when we started to go after competitive funding, they were sort of not not greatly excited about our efforts to do that because, you know, when you do these things, it does shift on, on especially on the tip, and you have to have the cooperation of, you know, the rest of the region plus uh, PennDOT regions in order to make that happen. So we've been very grateful um, to PennDOT who has now, you know, looked at us as a, a key partner because they realized what we could do when we work together and when we advocate together to get some projects done. So um, we consider PennDOT our dear friend, and when we pick up the phone because one of you calls us and says, hey, there's an issue with a, a ramp or a road or a sign, they're there. They're there right, right now on the spot answering the question. I, I, I have never seen you know, a response like that, so I, I all the credit in the world um, to them for that. You have to be at the table. You have to be collaborative, and I noticed a few minutes ago a friend here from Mobilify, Chris, are you still here? There he is back there. So, um, also dealing with, you know, how we move people around the county and how we get people from one place to another. And we, we do continue to work on um, what may be a pilot microtransit, on-demand microtransit plan. Um, again, working with our partners at SPC who looked at that plan that might help us move people around various sections of the county, as well as um, uh, the idea of maybe being able to look at some um, hubs that will allow, particularly, particularly because we know that as employers, you need employees and you need them to be able to come from all over this region, and so therefore, we've got to be able to move people and people have to be able to get access to the jobs and be able to get to the jobs. So one of the ways to do that, uh, while transit is extremely expensive, um, we can look at these microtransit options and try to run a pilot and hopefully uh, be able to answer those questions, including in the Slipper Rock area where students are trying to move around and get from place to place, or students who are traveling here to the university and are, are here um, studying from some other place. You need to get to the airport, you need to get to Cranberry, you need to get to other locations. So these are, these are critically important things, and we thank the advocates for 
for their work person, um, for all of us at SBC and all of these things. Thank you. Kim, this time last year you introduced the new manager of the Pittsburgh Butler Regional Airport, who had left just a short time after. What are the future plans for personnel at the airport? And there are a few other here. If you want to elaborate on the, the, the runway expansions and, uh, and the um, industrial development site we have out there, on and on. So, fortunately for Butler County, Stephanie Siraco uh, came out of retirement from working at the uh, Greater Pittsburgh International Airport, and uh, she uh, is working as our interim manager. <laughs> Um, as our former manager had left to return back to Washington, D.C. Um, Stephanie was hired, and uh, she is hired until we find a more permanent manager. Uh, she's doing a fabulous job for us. She's highly qualified and credentialed and pilot herself. Um, the Pittsburgh Butler Regional Airport is the fifth busiest airport in the Commonwealth. So that's a fun fact for uh, everybody here in the room. We're running approximately 75,000 flight operations per year and have 130 based aircraft. The airport also aims hangars. We have 80 spots available for lease, and these facilities are full, and there's a waiting list. So the extension's been discussed and efforts have um, been made in the past two decades to pursue it. And there's been a lot of momentum with uh, ebbing and flowing it pertaining to that uh, runway extension. The most recent planned runway extension project worked into over $25 million over the course of decades. And over the years, various airport managers and airport authority members uh, tried to make this happen. Um, it, it's, it takes monumental efforts to accomplish the goal of extending the runway. Um, the current, the current uh, distance for the runway is 4,800 in one foot. Uh, and we were trying to extend it to 5,000 feet to meet some aviation performance standards that are actually set not by the aircraft themselves, but by the insurance companies. And so the people that uh, tried to make this happen are to be commended for their efforts to make, you know, to try to make that a reality. But on August uh, 15th this past year, we met with the FAA and the BOA here in Butler County, and uh, they were pretty adamant in telling us that we could no longer pursue the runway extension at the Pittsburgh Butler Regional Airport. It was just too costly. And to put this into perspective, the BOA uh, and the FAA in, in PennDOT Bureau of Aviation in Harrisburg, they receive approximately $30 million of federal funding that funding trickles down into $10 million that is then distributed to all the airports uh, throughout the Commonwealth that are private. There's 120 private air, uh, airports and there's about 295 public airports uh, throughout uh, Pennsylvania. And that doesn't include the big airports in Pittsburgh and Philadelphia, of course. And so to put that into perspective, the FAA says we do not have the money to be able to support the runway extension project. So um, I want you to know the Pittsburgh Butler Regional Airport runway is not short by any means. It is adequate. And the new aircraft that are coming in have uh, newer technology and are not no longer requiring the longer runways. So we may have saved ourselves some money in the process. Uh, time will tell. But we're confident that the airports can remain the fifth busiest airport in the Commonwealth. We do not feel that business is going to be deterred here in Butler County because of the length of our runway. People are finding ways to come in here in Butler County who want to do business to do business. And it's not dependent upon the length of our runway. It's because of the collaboration, the leadership, the partnerships, the responsiveness uh, throughout the county uh, to make things happen, which improve the quality of, of life and all the investment that is going into the county through our municipalities to uh, make you know improvements with infrastructure. 
And so while this is disappointing news, in the past year, the airport's accomplished a lot. We've completed renovations on the current administrative building, including a new roof, waterproof ceiling of the exterior, upgrades to public restrooms and office spaces, and the restaurant now has a new outdoor seating on their deck, which overlooks the runway. Uh, we've hired Delta Airport consultants um, to develop and update the airport's master plan, which has already begun. McFarland Johnson was hired as the airport's new engineering consultant of record and management engineering corporation for construction management. We've begun a rehabilitation project on the Northwest ramp that the PennDOT Bureau of Aviation once done. The total project cost estimate is 1.5 plus MPDES uh, permit pumps. The long range vision is to have additional corporate hangar pads available off that ramp that will benefit the airport by generating new revenue sources that will benefit both the airport and the fixed based operator, which is AirQuest. McFarland Johnson is currently facilitating project administration and management, design services, and bidding phase services. In the fall of 23, in November, the airport authority entered into a MOU with the federal FAA for an application for inclusion in the FAA's federal contract tower program for a potential remote control tower at the airport to address safety and congestion of air traffic as one of the five busiest airports in the Commonwealth. And in March 2022, as you're aware, Congressman Kelly earmarked $2 million for the Pittsburgh Butler Regional Airport in a spending package for community project funding and we're very grateful to him. These monies are going to be used to offset costs associated with the Northwest Ramp Rehabilitation and the various projects listed on our JSIP, which is our Joint Automated Capital Improvement Program. The Airport Authority met with Congressman Kelly several weeks ago to review these projects underway at the airport, and he was very supportive. In 2023, the Pittsburgh uh, Butler Airport uh, was designated as one of three airports throughout the Commonwealth with an Aldi's, and that's an airport land development zone. And we have uh, we have adjacent property, and, and what that does, it, it allows us to submit plans um, to develop that property, accelerate development activity on land and vacant buildings owned by airports as a way of providing new revenue sources to them. And so the amount of tax credits the Aldi's pr provides is an Aldi's employer may earn in a single tax year $2,100 for each full-time employee during the tax year for up to 10 years during the period beginning July 1st, 2022 and ending June 30th, 2041. So conceptual design and development plans are underway, which will involve working closely with Penn Township supervisors on a potential overlay project and has some money set aside for extending public sewer line, both of which are needed to advance the Aldi's future development. So the next four years are going to be dedicated to developing, um, working to get the final design and the conceptuals, all the permitting, the overlay, working with the Penn Township supervisors um, to position this property for that works in conjunction with the Penn Township comprehensive plan. So it's an exciting time at the airport, and we invite you to come out to the restaurant, and when the weather is permitting, sit outside and enjoy the view. Thank you, Kim. Mark. Hello, there we go. Mark, before we get into industrial development and agriculture, can you talk about workforce initiatives that are in place to keep Butler County competitive? Sure, Ellen. Let me start by uh, talking a little bit about the Butler County Growth Collaborative and their role in steering many, many activities, um, one of which is workforce development. The Growth Collaborative is made up by partners with uh, Cranberry Township, uh, the Transit Authority, and Tourism. Yeah. 
the CBC, <laughs> the Chamber of Commerce, and the Healthcare Provider Independence Health. You know, I guess the best examples I can give you with respect to workforce development, and uh, the leader of our workforce development initiative is Mary Salome, sitting at about three tables over, and also a member of the CDC. But I'll give you a couple examples. One example goes back to my past life at AK Steel, and that was the relationship that we had with Slippery Rock University and their industrial hygiene and safety program, a baccalaureate program that provides safety professionals some of the top of the industry. And uh, I know we utilized our students from an intern perspective, and we hired many of those. I'm going to move to my present day activities and talk about, so we're bringing a new business or recording a business to come into Butler County. A real world, real world example, trademark plastics. Some of the initial site visits with those individuals included Joe Saylor from the CDC and Lisa Campbell, the Dean of Workforce Development from the Community College. They work with that particular employee as they identify what their needs might be in terms of skills and the like. They structured a, a training program for that individual company and executed that learning for on your site. So that's the kind of relationship we have with our educational institutions. I would be remiss in not talking about our trade unions. You know, we have some wonderful trade unions in the area. Many of you have been at events at the Steam Fitter location and they play a vital role in advancing economic uh, impact here in the region. The last piece I'll talk about is a program that the Commission itself with the Growth Collaborative uh, initiated a couple years ago, and it's called Personal Empowerment. The Empowerment Initiative takes individuals that have specific workforce challenges Maybe they have some drug and alcohol issues in their past. Maybe they have been incarcerated. And maybe we'll call them second chance employees. Aside from skills-based learning that they receive, we enter into a program called Empowerment. That Empowerment Initiative, under the direction of Tricia Pritchard at the uh, college, uh, in the last year, is done 180 individuals and provided them emotional intelligence in addition to the skills-based training that have allowed them to re-enter the workplace. So those are a couple of, um, of the comments. Thank you, Mark. Um, I'm going to call them all over here so we get through a few more and get some of the questions from the table. Mark, if you don't mind, would you please give us a little bit of an update on the plans for the uh, Armco AK Steel plant site? Uh, share with us what you can. So the plant two, uh, plant two site has been vacant for probably 10 years. And it's right in the bottom. And um, you know, demolition has been completed at that site. Brownfield uh, remediation has started. And uh, we are in the process. Uh, I'm not at liberty to talk about who the five businesses are, but we have secured uh, letters of intent from five businesses. Uh, the net result of that will be about 250 to 300 employees. Uh, with those employees uh, and that site, we've done a pretty comprehensive evaluation of that site. Uh, we partnered with Moss Architectural Firm out of uh, Lawrenceville, and uh, in fact, the design for that site uh, won a regional award of excellence for innovation. Uh, it plays on the roots of that area, even in the island area, of affordable workforce housing, as well as the manufacturing uh, businesses going into that location. 
Thank you. Um, Devin, can you share with us some oversight on the future of EMS? Sure. Can you hear this one? Uh, sure, so EMS has been a, a topic. Um, I, I still hold my EMT certification in firefighting, but when I became a commissioner and I ended up at CCAP, we talked about how important that is. The role that I learned there was that the fact that a lot of counties were dealing with the same situation. And so there's reports, SR60, and I won't go through SR60, SR6. One was done in 2004, one was done in 2018, and I really think they could have Xeroxed it and it would have been the same concern if a few extras added. And a lot of that is labor force, a lot of it is income, a lot of it is reimbursable. Um, but, they, but the problem was there was no, never any action taken. And so we were able to convince CCAP to start a task force in 2018 and we put out a report in 2019. And at that point in 2019, when I talked about the priorities when they were voted on in 2019, um, it, it became the top priority, two years running. It was the top priority the first year, the second priority the second year. So it is a vast, large, complex issue, and it's not easy to point at. And so they commissioned a study with DCED and a uh, consulting company, and Butler County was one of the five pilot counties to be researched. And so we took that information, and we came back and we talked to our EMS providers in Butler. We sat down with them and explained what was in the report, what was happening. And I had to go backwards a little bit in the fact that the reason why we had to struggle with getting the EMS task force is because counties are not responsible for EMS or fire. We're not responsible for that. That is up to your municipal government, your township, and your borough. However, they don't have the arm to go to lobby, and they don't have the arm to do what we could do at the county level. And so they were coming to us anyway, and so they were bringing their issues with them. And so what we decided to do is we finalized the report. Kim Leslie and I took this on the chin and, and went back out. The EMS Council, the good thing is, it has reestablished itself. So all the agencies are back together in a room and discussing how they can make it more efficient. And finally, at the end of the day, we were providing a couple of different um, outcomes of that conversation. They identified 125 short on EMTs. Uh, so there's a um, cohort program that's going to be starting in June, if I remember correctly, um, at the BC3 campus where they cover the cost of the person's time being there. So there's a time stipend, there's a cost of the class itself, there's a cost of books, and there's a cost of the National Registry exams will all be covered. And so that person then will have a guaranteed employment after them, and it will be an accelerated six-week course, six or seven-week course, so that they'll be able to go right into the workforce. So that's number one. Number two, we put on our RFP and said, give us your ideas. How else can we help? And one of them was, in the northern tier of Butler County, we have struggling annual services of thinner, which you would expect from the population. And when they leave their area, they're gone for much longer time periods. So you have to think about that. There's a, there's a complexity to that. So there is now a, uh, a provider that's providing an ALS service unit in northern tier North Washington area. Uh, that's extra service outside of what we've already had. And we're also looking at staffing issues that we're working with uh, Independence Health. And so Independence Health and Butler Ambulance Service are looking at how we can staff up the other ambulance services. So it's Slippery Rock, they contract paramedics uh, to come out to their units so that they have enough paramedics. Paramedics are also short. Um, so we also know that there's a, a way to work together. So we're working on these collaborations, and that's about the best I can tell you right now. And these are not long-term fixes. These are short. These are short-term fixes. And so we have to look, go back and go back to our legislators. We've looked at things like you may have heard the authority model. The authority model allows the county to take over and, and do an authority-style uh, service for EMS. And so that's still being looked at. The good part about what I like about it is it's not a requirement. It is, it is an authorization to do it, not a requirement to do it. So we get to make that choice still at a local level. I think that covers it. Thank you. I think this question will help cover a couple from the, uh, the tables. So we're going to go with uh, Leslie. Uh, manufacturing is clearly important, and it is a vital piece of the public. Can you speak on the county's efforts to assist manufacturing companies from both attention and expansion standpoint. I have two questions in there. Yeah, we have, we have some questions up here that have been submitted, so I'm going to try to, in addition to talking about manufacturing quickly, I'm going to try to answer those questions. So first of all, we have more manufacturers in Butler County than any other county in the Commonwealth. We make things here. <laughs> we are a global leader in safety products for oil and gas industry, construction, utilities, and the fire service. We are manufacturers that are improving auto safety, electric vehicles, and assisting 
in the commercialization of space. We are making precision parts for NASA and SpaceX here, and protective glass for military vehicles. Our glass is in buildings all over the world. We are producing the grain-oriented electrical steel for transformers that provide energy security for this country. We are providing communities with valves and for waste or for water and wastewater systems and treatment. We're producing oil splashes and polymers for the beauty uh, and personal care industry, for food and baking, pharmaceuticals, and that is just touching the surface of what we do in this county with our manufacturers. And we know when manufacturing is strong, all of the rest of your businesses are, are strong as well. So what, what do we, where are we on that? So one, you know, because we have low property taxes, because our property taxes are reasonable, manufacturers want to move here, they can expand, they can buy land, they can, and we want them to expand here, and they're looking to do that. Um, second is the infrastructure. If we don't address the infrastructure issues um, so that they can move freight, so that they have the, the utilities they need, the supplies they need to produce the products they need, um, we have to make sure that infrastructure is strong. You heard us talk all about that today. Um, we provide funding for the Community Development Corporation for technical assistance, um, for the site selection, working for expansion plans with municipalities, and dealing with the utility issues by removing all the barriers. And I will tell you that they are working with a number of manufacturers who are expanding, one of them right in the city of Butler itself, and that answers one of the questions on the economic a piece of the economic development question between the county and the city, which was one of those questions for next year, thank you very much, about that. And so um, those are the kinds of things that have to continue to happen by uh, making sure that we have the technical support for companies who want to expand here and help to help them remove barriers. Um, we support and sponsor them in applications for economic development grants and assistance. I think public technology is one of a, a great grant for um, their expansion and, Assistance. We call attention to the manufacturers at the regional and state levels and on various local programs um, to make sure that they have access to programs and uh, assistance that, um, that can help them uh, with uh, upskilling and upgrading and um, expanding their facilities. <clears throat> we um, act as a liaison with municipalities and PennDOT, removing freight and transportation barriers. Just last week, Mark was working with one of our companies trying to make sure he could get his freight moved not only through multiple municipalities, but down the interstate under a, in, during a construction uh, time frame. Um, again, advocating, sitting at the table, working alongside, and this answers, uh, I think, the question about what are we doing to help Cleveland Cliffs. And I can tell you that for the last several years, you know, we have been uh, interfacing with the federal government with and writing letters of support and showing up and I just was last week doing video um, for the UAW on the impact of uh, this Cleveland Cliffs plant in our community and how critically important it is that we maintain the non the grain oriented electrical steel in our transformers in order to ensure that this country is secure in its energy supply because there are policies and tariffs that could severely affect that plant and if that plant goes you know what happens so this community is in big trouble that plant generates the highest amount of payroll taxes in this county and maybe in this region you know so um the payroll, the payroll of that plant is the highest. So it's supporting, even higher than Westinghouse, quite frankly. So it is supporting a lot of industry here. And the policies matter. Um, and so between you know, both the tariff side as well as this policy where they want to change from the grain oriented electoral seal to amorphous metals, um, the Department of Energy is trying to push that effort. And this, you know, this community is uh, come together with its uh, federal, state, local officials to try to push back against that and help people to understand the impact of it. Um, and so if you you really need to, to reach out and learn a little bit more about it, I'm not going to go into all the details today, but rest assured that um, we are out there advocating. They want to be able to walk. They want to be able to enjoy the communities. Uh, they want to be able to have uh, transportation to get there. We are investing in helping our uh, parks with local park grants because they want recreation. You know, 
You all want recreation and want to be able to enjoy the community that you live in. Uh, we are also touring the launch of a manufacturing readiness grant because what we have learned, or a grant program, because what we are now learning is that in order to deploy things like robotics, um, you can collateralize equipment, you can borrow money for equipment uh, or robotics that can collateralize that. But to prepare your uh, entity to be ready for that, there's a lot of activity that occurs that you can't collateralize. So we're trying to figure out how to help manufacturers uh, be able to upgrade their facilities and doing that. That's a, we're exploring um, the opportunity that we may have to provide that as well. Uh, again, thanks to some efforts in the region that are working toward those. Um, and then just real quickly with some of these questions, someone did ask about the 228 project from Mars to Franklin Road. Uh, interestingly enough, that's why we were in DC. Um, so we're looking to finish that project. PennDOT has already committed 15 and a half million upcoming transportation improvement plan to, to the final uh, segment of uh, 228. Uh, however, that will do the pre-engineering and the, um, the utility work in the right of way is necessary that we would be ready, but we have to go and apply for funding for the construction for the final three mile segment uh, that you mentioned from Mars to Franklin Road. So, that answers, I think, a couple of the questions um, that uh, are up here. Uh, but to ooh, workforce, childcare. Um, there was a question here about childcare, which we know is absolutely critical as well. And um, Carrie, I think that we need to sit down and talk about, uh, we have, and, and we need the YMCA to talk to the hospital. Because <laughs> those, are, those are entities that we've got to come together as businesses and childcare providers to figure out how we're going to be able to be, um, how we're going to be able to support the workforce uh, with childcare effectively here, because we know it's a challenge. Nice job. <laughs> All right, so manufacturing is one of the biggest industries in the county. So is agriculture. Kim, you oversee the conservation district. First, what is the Butler County Conservation Conservation District? Is it strictly related to farms, or is it also related to industrial development? Well, it's, it's both. It, we were incorporated in 1945, and so originally it was about, you know, soil and water, because the conservation districts were kind of originated from the experience of the 1940s Dust Bowl era. And so uh, it originally started out to help uh, support natural resources pertaining to water and soil only with farmers and then they evolved into uh, permitting and, and being kind of an extension with the DEP, the Department of Environmental Protection at the state level as far as enforcing those policies, making sure farmers were in compliance as well as uh, people that do any type of land development. So when you're doing land development, you come to the conservation district, as you're aware, some of you in this room, you, you make application for permitting. It, it's a, a daunting process. We're trying to streamline that. We've been working with DEP, brought them here to Butler County, brought the builders in the room with the developers and the conservation districts, and uh, there's been great improvements since then. Um, and that was just a couple of years ago. But um, back to the permitting process. It's, uh, it can be a delay, and what does how this affects uh, people trying to do land development, construction, new business is is those delays cost time, and time costs money, and it may delay a project from commencing, you know, construction, and so uh, it's such a problem statewide that um, uh, due to just staffing shortages and, and you know regulation. Uh, what, what the governor has done is he has added $7 million into the budget specifically to help DEP streamline the permitting process and to hire a, at least 45 new staff to help with planning, you know, reviewing plans. Uh, so from a construction point, uh, that perspective, that's, that's hopeful. Um, the conservation district uh, does as I said, also, they administer in a program called, uh, with state funding, ACAP, Agricultural Conservation um, Assistance Program, and that's for farmers for best management practices to um, 
do projects on their farms and their properties pertaining to farming, agriculture, um, land erosion, soil water projects, um, you know, more manure management, nutrient management projects. Um, as far as like our farms, um, we, we have a farmland preservation program in Butler County. We have uh, preserved 75 farms in Butler County. We have over 7,546 acres to preserve. Uh, rich farmland that's preserved and it covers over 24 municipalities in Butler County. And why this is important is one U.S. farm uh, feeds 166 people annually, both in the United States and abroad. And considering the projected global population increase of 2.2 billion in the year, by year 2050, our world's farmers are going to need to produce approximately 70% 70, 70 more food than they are now. This is one of the reasons why you hear about China buying farmland here in America, why you hear Bill Gates and various um, uh, people buying up farmland, because food is going to become the mechanism over the people um, pertaining to power and how to control populations in the future. Thank you, Kim. Kevin, talk a little bit about manufacturing and agriculture. Tourism is a big industry here as well. This summer, Buffalo County is set to host the Can-Am Games. First, what is the Can-Am Games? What's your role in this event? You provide some insight on registered participants and potential economic impact. Sure, this is probably a better question for Jack and Amy, but I can be honest with you, they, they um, from tourism's point of view, one of the things that we uh, work on at CCAP to get is the hotel tax and what that importance of, of having that tax is and what it generates. And so we're uh, blessed in Butler County to have several hotels that are very, uh, doing very well. And it helps support our tourism. And one of the things you may have heard of the Duke Festival, that's another event that brings a lot of people in. Just like that, this is the Can Am Games, which is Canadian American Games, which is all first responders, fire, police, EMS, dispatchers. Um, and several other uh, sheriffs and, and uh, corrections officers to participate in every sort of imaginable game you can think of, and uh, it was it's being brought back into uh, into uh, the U.S. this year in 2024 in June. Is that exactly what date? June 10th. July 15th. Oh, sorry, July 15th. <laughs> and uh, they're taking over every single uh, event center and programming. And I know Slipper Rock University is a partner and BC Breeze partners. And they are basically bringing everyone here and their families, participating in everything from poker, uh, clay shoots, uh, fishing. Uh, there's a million things. I mean, there's a list of them, a lithium. And the tourism and group, along with several of the partners that they've been listed, I know Tony Saul, the sheriff's office, have been capitalizing on bringing calls in from businesses for advertisement, uh, home loan programs for um, first responders, uh, some of the but basically what we're doing is drawing into Butler County to let people see the quality of life and the importance of that, the economic value of that. Um, the best story that I, I think I've ever heard was somebody came from California to look at property in Allegheny. Nothing against this, my buddy Rich down there, but um, they happened to drive, they happened to drive through Zillian and Oakland and fell in love with it. I thought this is, this is a really nice place, I could really raise my family here. Well at the same time, uh, the Kaufman house was being redone done and it was completed. And uh, they, they ended up moving their entire operation to that location in Slinope. And so when I heard that, I thought that's pretty cool because not only was this person drawn into the area by an event, he was also into a location that tourism was purchased originally and we ended up going out with a private developer and making such a beautiful place consortium or healthcare consortium. It's critical because every one of these pieces play together. And if we're not bringing folks together like this, and bringing folks together uh, into our community to see what, how beautiful it is here. And we're not showing our best foot forward if we don't have nice sidewalks, if we don't have nice safe places to live, if we don't have houses built, that are built and ready to go for workforce development housing, then we're not prepared to, to even bring them in. So at this point, it's all hands on deck because honestly, we're blowing up. And that's a good thing. And so that's where we're a little envious. Uh, the other counties are a little envious of us. We have the appreciable growth here in Butler County and others are shrinking. That's not always good for us, for our surrounding counties, because we have people moving in, 
Uh, but at the same time, we're working on regional projects to help them as well. So I think it's important that it's not just Butler County all day, every day. It's working with Allegheny counties and Beaver counties and Anango counties and Armstrong. So hope that answers your question. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> nice one. Um, I know we're close, ladies and gentlemen, but we're going to hit two more questions. I want to make sure I leave a few minutes for our media. Those questions. Leslie, let's talk uh, county government. Being fiscally conservative is a must for county government. Right now, Butler County holds a superior advantage over neighbor neighboring counties offering high quality of life and competitive taxes. You provide a high level overview on the principles you have employed over eight plus years of leadership that led to the success of the well oiled county government machine. Thank you. A machine. I never, that's kind of cool. I never thought of us as a machine, but we'll be a machine today. All right, well, first of all, I have to give 100% um, credit to all of the team at the county who works with us. Not only the elected officials, such as the controller, who, by the way, is very proud of his annual comprehensive financial report, and you really should go online and take a look at it. But there is actually, there is some extremely valuable information in there. And so, credit to the controller for um, the report that helps uh, helps guide us, you know, really in the decision making process. But first of all, it was the budget. Um, you know, any any time you're doing the budget, there's a process, there's procedures, and we made a lot of changes in the way that we do that budget so that we can clearly identify what the actual expenses and the actual <laughs> revenue was to be, was to be, and also to take the contingency piece of planning kind of out of the hands of the directors and elected officials and into the county itself, so that you know people always want to plan for the contingent within their own department. Yes. And what that does is it ends up not helping you understand what the real costs of running it is. And so we have, we do have a contingency fund. We have been really fortunate because everybody's done such a fabulous job of managing their expenses and departments that we haven't really had to use that contingency over the last several years. So what that did for us and what that did, when we, when we walked into office, we had a fund balance that was probably right around $2 million. And I can remember the auditor who was sitting in the room as we were preparing to kick off saying, well, you've got a problem because you don't, you don't have a fund balance. When you don't have a fund balance, you don't have a backup. And so we are now from two to that. Uh, we finished last year with just about a $30 million fund balance. Now, granted, some of that is, there's a, a small portion of that that is uh, reserved or dedicated for certain things, but, and there has been some federal money. But the reality of that is, it's all been because of, a lot of it has been because of um, the good work that our directors and our officials and those in our departments have done to manage that, because you want to make sure that, and we, and we have a growing county because of all of you. So our revenues are growing, but we don't want our expenses to outpace our revenues, and that is what has been uh, working well for us. So all of that comes together. Second, we've had very positive labor negotiations. We took a little bit of a different strategy in our labor, labor negotiations when we took office, and we're on. But that was not our. That was not our thing. That was what we were handed. Um, so the fact that we were then able to increase the number of federal inmates that we house. And then to um, negotiate uh, with federal marshals for uh, an increased rate. Um, what that's doing, uh, that in revenue is covering uh, the, the debt service on that prison. So um, that enables us to cover that debt service ongoing without necessarily dealing with the increased costs. Um, we have hired a procurement director who is doing a fabulous job of you know, really negotiating on all of our contracts and all of our um, uh, services that we need. Uh, we've leveraged the fees, like the Act 13 fees that we talked about um, in many different ways, including being um, responsible in developing a capital budget and putting money back into the building and the facilities that the county owns, which are somewhat vast, um, to be able to make sure that we're putting that money into capital. And because of building a reserve, and because of um, good fiscal use of uh, ARPA funds that we have had available to us, you know, we're going to be able to uh, put money aside to fund capital needs at least for the next five years, and those are those ongoing capital needs. So we've made a concerted effort to make sure that that money is there um, to take care of any uh, building improvements, maintenance, those sorts of things for the next five years. Um, the positive interest environment, thank you, thanks, um, has been very helpful. 
um, to us and our, our treasurer, uh, Diane Marburger, has done an incredible job of uh, positioning our funds to earn the maximum interest, and that is um, assisting us as well this year. And so um, definitely um, kudos to Diane and the team there for that. And Kevin indicated, you know, advocating for things like um, uh, the 911 fees because, again, what was happening is what you were paying on your phone bill, it wasn't coming all back to this county. It was going to, to fund the other counties, and we've been able now to um, uh, fully, pretty much fully fund 911 as a result of those fees. So what that does is takes pressure off the, uh, the general fund budget uh, to, to fill the gap. Um, what that, all of that work has uh, increased our bond rating. We were at AA minus. We uh, this year we've been to AA, so um, that that bodes well for the county, I think. And um, also to mention, you know, we um, we no longer, you know, as far as cash flow goes. In the past, when we came into office, they used to have to take tax anticipation notes. At the end of the year, we no longer have to do that. We can flow our cash. So, um, again, sorry, kudos banks, sorry banks. <laughs> but nonetheless, um, you know, we, we consider you all great partners in those efforts. Um, just to kind of, and then I'm going to set up, um, there was a question about ARPA funds and do we have any of those funds left? We do. However, um, the need far outseeks what we, <laughs> far exceeds what we do have left. We're just trying to very strategically plan. They do have to be um, basically, um, allocated by the end of this year, um, and we are looking at, you know, we still have, we've had, you know, we put a lot of those monies out to municipalities for those infrastructure needs, particularly the, the Southwest Stormwater Group, which was an incredible partnership of municipalities in the Southwest region, who put together the stormwater plan to address flooding and other issues. Um, then they were, because that plan was ready, and again, the key is having the plan, and a, or a portfolio of plans in your pocket so that when funding becomes available and when it became available, they were ready to go because we funded the plan on the front end and they were able to do that. So um, we can take advantage and leverage those dollars. And Kevin, maybe you want to just take a moment to talk about how we're leveraging uh, the opioid funds as well. I've kind of set up for that one. So the opioid uh, funds that came in from the settlement of the uh, drug and alcohol or drug companies, uh, pharmacists, Walmart's, and so on, it's about a billion dollars across the state. Um, Pennsylvania hit above its weight class and was able to retain more money than the other uh, states as far as our population goes. Of that, uh, there's a trust board of 13, one of which I sit on, but the important part about this is how the money can be spent. So it's got to be towards prevention and treatment. That's got to be the requirement, the priority. Um, it is uh, also allowed to be used for um, uh, recovery center uh, programming. So it's not really a, a treatment program, it is a recovery center. One of the things we found by working with a lot of our departments, a lot of our folks that are in recovery, said, look, we really can't go hang out at social clubs and bars and hang out. So there's a need for this type of uh, interaction. We also need a place that if we are having housing barriers, or we are having employment barriers, or we are having these issues, we need somewhere to go. So that is underway as we speak. There will be, uh, you may be familiar with the old net or wall in, in downtown Butler that will be uh, uh, owned by uh, uh, an entity here in Butler on our behalf. And we are able to expedite uh, some of the services that are going to go in there and um, construction to get that project out of the way. Uh, some of the other things that we are able to do is help the EMS um, because if they go out and provide uh, uh, care, and that, a lot of people may not know this, if, if you don't get in the back of the ambulance, they don't get paid. Who do that? Most people don't know that. So they've been on these calls and they're at the front line of the opioid crisis. They've been on the front line for many, many years, and the reality is they're not getting funded to do it. And so that, that uh, backup funding uh, that we can provide uh, for leave behind encouraging them to get into treatment and do what we call warm handoffs back to the hospital or uh, treatment programs, all of that can be covered under the opioid settlement funds. And so we have come together as a group, we've come together as a public and, and discussed where our money should go and created buckets. And those buckets include re-entry programs from jail to provide ongoing treatment, ongoing medical treatment, ongoing um, programs that, look, let's be honest, these are not taxpayer dollars. 
These are settlement dollars from companies that took advantage of a situation that hurt a lot of people. And so we're trying to pick people back up that are already caught up in the, in the realm of this. That's what these funds are for. So when I, you know, it's, it's a, I give, again, I know Rich Goldinger's here. He also engaged with our drug and alcohol director, uh, Dawn, the Letty program and the Law Enforcement Treatment Initiative, where many law enforcement run out of options because, let's be honest, if you're addicted, you're addicted. And if you're addicted today, you're going to be addicted tomorrow, regardless. A lot of people are going to end up in jail. So in order to avoid that, if they agree to go into a treatment program, they can avoid additional uh, charges. And so that's uh, through the AG's office in Pennsylvania. Uh, that's another program that we have available to us. It's a tool. It doesn't work every time. And anybody can in, refer to the Letty program. School districts can, anyone. Uh, so keep that in mind as well. Uh, but we have a close eye on our opioid dollars. They've, uh, we've received about $1.6 in Butler. We'll receive uh, additional monies over the 18 years. We're expecting a second wave uh, to come in, so there will be additional dollars. Uh, but what that doesn't mean, what I'm, what I'm trying to say is, yes, there's money coming in, but we have to sustain programming that we're beginning now. And so we're going to continue to do that, and we're pretty secure for 18 years, and we'll have to figure it out from there on. But I think we'll be okay. Uh, Got it. Okay, thanks. So from the fiscal standpoint, on that, on that same topic, we are, um, we are mandated to provide medically assisted treatment in the prison to those who are coming in who are already on um, some sort of MAT, medically assisted treatment program. So we made, we made sure um, that the first big bucket was going to be to cover that cost because so that that didn't fall back on the general fund. And kudos to the prison board who is monitoring that. Uh, there are also some other funds that became available to us through grant funding and et cetera that we're able to do. So we want to make sure that that doesn't fall back, you know, on the burden of the, the general fund as well. And that's what the intent, you know, of those um, those funds were. So it matters how we take this, these extra dollars, whether they're from fees, whether they're from funds, whatever that might be. It matters how you apply that because that affects, you know, the property tax at the end of the day because... Our, our goal is to keep that cost in the Thank you. Thank you. Hey, um, you guys bear with us for just a few minutes. I do want to give the media an opportunity to ask a question. Uh, I know we've reached our plan time, uh, but uh, I, we don't get this opportunity off. So we just bear with us for a few minutes. Baltimore um, County seems to have a seemingly uh, fair little bit of flow job this rate, covering around 3.5% each, each uh, month, I look at it. Just what do you feel like we are doing uh, better than some of the other counties in the region? Not that it's too much of a competitive thing, but like when you compare us to the other region, we really like, expect uh, just what do you feel like we're doing with that? Is there anything that the county can do to help them during their 
difficult struggles right now with going financially due to COVID. Don, I think those, those discussions have been ongoing with independent health about some you know, very specific um, programs that can assist them, um, specific to what the services are that are provided to the community and how we can collaborate to drive that cost down. Um, and secondly, um, I think we've had some discussions about workforce and about you know uh, child care to that point and all the things that are necessary. Um, and we have begun those you know, discussions about how we move forward collaboratively together to make sure that the, the workforce is there for them and what can we do to uh, make sure that happens. Because again, back to the low employment, you know, <clears throat> there's a there's an incredible demand. We also have lots of vacancies seen that in, in positions, but we have a diversity of, you know, we have a diversity of jobs, which I think is what makes us stable. Um, those that require you know, a master's degree to those that require just, you know, skill training. And I think, again, to the extent that Mark brought that up with the college and the, um, and the university, you know, the, the fact that we can provide all those various levels of training and trade um, education allows that that low unemployment to take place, but that we have said, long said that they were such a partner with us in surviving the entire COVID um, that it is extremely important that you know, we try to remain um, as a community health system, and they've done a good job of doing that. And, and that this is going to be, you know, that they're in it for the long haul, and it's, you know, we know that they're going to work their way, we'll work our way back out of it, but they're not the only health system. They're, uh, they're, every health system is facing the same issue. They are not unique in that manner. So, you know, we're going to continue to work together to help them address those issues. Just to tag on to that, the, uh, there's a long-standing history of working with independent public health care. One of those is uh, working with the um, EMS. We just talked about that workforce and how they're going to be able to help drive that out. That's, that's going to help them as well. It's um, going to help sustain some of their jobs so that they don't have to do any additional job. And in addition to that, our human services is working on. Yeah, and then the human services piece of that is where we're going in to help um, renovate a, cer a certain portion of the uh, uh, treatment programs that they have available to, at the uh, hospital as well that they have been able to do in 30, 40 years. So hopefully those pieces will be able to help them out as well. Specifically, the, the uh, department that houses the, the department for mental health at the hospital needed to make some uh, upgrades, and so we were able to bring some funds to the table for human services to assist them. Physical work on the table. Yes, is there any chance of uh, what happened in Washington County of uh, UPMC or another health care provider coming in? And, I mean, if it, if there's some arguments right now between UPMC and the Washington County uh, health care provider and union, if something sort of like that to happen in the county, is that a possibility? That's the very reason, the very reason that Independence joined with um, Excel Health and became now the third largest provider of uh, health care in the region. So, they strengthened their position by, by taking that very um, very risky but very brave move in, in bringing those two health systems together. And while it was hard for us to see a change in the name from Butler to Independence, um, there's there's a reason that it's Independence um, because again, you know that that helps uh, strengthen their position in the long haul. It's never easy in the beginning. Nothing's ever easy, but I think. Um, I think they've now positioned themselves well to, to make sure that we maintain our community hospitals. Um, also, Mark Gordon, for the, um, you mentioned the 250 to 300 jobs at the uh, ADC the, uh, uh, site. Um, are those retail jobs? Are those manufacturing jobs? Are they office jobs? <coughs> they will be manufacturing jobs. Okay. I want to thank everybody for coming out. Uh, I really, uh, really appreciate your patience and your time. You've been a wonderful audience. I'd like to thank our sponsors one more time before we uh, log out of here. Pennsylvania American Water, Independence Health System, Univest Financial, Thompson Miller Funeral Home, Armstrong, Center for Community Resources, 
Penn Energy Resources, Minuteman Press Butler, Butler County Tourism and Convention Bureau, Ford Office of Technology, Herbert Roland Ruby Inc., Next Tier Bank, Myra Drusel, First Commonwealth Bank, Butler County Manufacturing Consortium, Lola Energy, and of course our panel this morning. Thank you very much.